You know why I'm clean shaven? Because I went to a job interview today. The job pays minimum wage and does not require any university diploma. And I'm not going to get it. <laughs> I think if they offer it to me, I'd, I'd probably have to refuse, to be clear. But just so you know, just so you know, <laughs> um, had a productive conversation uh, yesterday with a young man. He says he's in his late 20s about philosophy, politics, and life. If you're still in your teenage years when watching this, it will probably sound completely meaningless to you to have an older guy like me say, you know what, philosophy is not about logic. It's not about abstract reasoning. Philosophy is really about life. Philosophy is really about how you are going to live your life, how we are going to live our lives. And, and you know what? Politics. It's not about abstract reasoning. It's not about logic. There's a sense in which politics is not even about right or wrong or correct or incorrect. Politics also, it's really about life. It's really about how you're going to live your life, how we're going to live our life. I understand. If you're 19 years old hearing this, it sounds like complete bullshit to you. All right? Because when, when you say this is about living my life, are you talking about uh, which bakery I go to to buy my bread? Are you talking about, you know, going skateboarding in your spare time? Like, what, whatever it is. You like, I understand when you're a young person, what you think of as life and what that means to you, it's something quite different from what it means to middle-aged people uh, like myself. And there's another bias that creeps into all of this discourse. Discourse about philosophy, discourse about politics, the discourse about taking philosophy and politics and life and putting them together and getting something out of it, getting something out of the next five years of your life, for example. You know, there's a very strange bias that creeps in depending upon at what age you got involved in the game, right? So, I mean, you know, some people, some people start reading about communism when they're like 12 years old, all right? There, there are red diaper babies. There are people who are raised with communism from birth. And there are people who, like, at the end of high school, their last year, they, they haven't even heard these terms. I, I think I've told this story before. I had a history professor uh, at university, and he said he had a student come up to him at the end of a lecture. So this is a university-level lecture. And he said, um, during the lecture today, you mentioned World War II. So, so does that imply there was some other war before that? This was a white, English-speaking Canadian, born and raised in Canada. He had literally never heard of World War II before. He had literally never heard of World War I before. He was at university level. There, there are people who get involved in politics late. There are people who start thinking about philosophy late in life. And in a lot of ways, they bring a very detached, mature perspective to, to politics by getting involved away. And there are people who form really deep sentimental and emotional connections to concepts, to words, to historical figures because they get involved with this stuff early. Now, look, there are advantages to getting involved early. There are advantages to being becoming a well-educated person early in life rather than like, there are also disadvantages. To help you visualize this, Buddhism. Imagine a 30-year-old man Who's, who's barely heard of Buddhism. He's seen it in some Kung Fu movies. He has no familiarity with Asian culture, Asian languages, or Buddhism. And for some, in his 30s, he starts to get interested for the first time. And he walks to the library to get out some books on Buddhism. And he walks to a Buddhist temple and has a conversation with a Buddhist monk. He is going to show up with a rational, mature attitude towards Buddhism. Even just implicitly, he is going to be demanding that Buddhism live up to his expectations as a rational, well-educated, middle-aged man. He's going to be looking at these books. He's going to be talking to this monk. And like, without even making a conscious effort, there's like a filter there. He's going to be filtering out a purely superstitious, um, purely affective elements. Of the, we, we, okay, this is real uh, anth anthropological jargon. Purely performative aspects of religion. He, ritual. Is not, he's not going to, in his 30s, show up and say, you know what, I need a magical ritual to make me feel better about having a broken arm. You know, they do that in Buddhism. It's a real example. You know, he's not going to show up and say, you know what, I need a ritual to drive the ghosts out of my home. 
no, right? He's going to be approaching this in a certain way. Um, and he may not be aware of it. And I often see the Buddhist monks and the university professors and so on, and they all react to it without anyone spelling it. Like, oh, here's someone approaching where we have to present the religion and the philosophy in this very rationalized way. Okay. What if the same guy had gone to the library and gone to the Buddhist temple at age 16? It's different. He would have brought something different to it. He would have taken something different from it. And his own desires, his own needs would have shaped the discourse in a very different way. Okay? What if he was born into a Buddhist family? What if he was first engaging with the religion as a child, as a toddler even, right? The engagement with superstition, completely different. The types of questions you're asking and the answers you're being given, when it's your grandmother answering your question, where do people go after they die? And you're a small child and she's an old woman. It's completely different from you're a, you're a man in your 30s and you go in and you ask, hey, hey you know, I've, I got these books at the library and it says you believe in reincarnation. Tell me, can you, can you explain technically how does this and that happen? What do you believe? Completely different experience, right? <laughs> yeah, this is a case in which the observer shapes the experience more than they know. Right? You're shaping the experience by the questions you're asking, the answers that you're rejecting, the answers that aren't good enough, which books you take off the shelf, the relationships of authority, right? Sometimes that are completely unseen, right? If you got involved with left wing politics in your 30s, if you got involved with left wing politics as a teenager, if you were born and raised in left wing politics, these things shape you in a very different way also what you know about left-wing politics and how you feel about left-wing politics will be very different because you have been shaping the politics and the philosophy at every stage just as much as or even more than our example taken from Buddhism. Um, a lot of you people in the audience, young or old, you won't be able to easily relate to my warning. When I say to this guy in his 20s again and again, stop thinking in terms of abstractions on a chalkboard. Stop thinking about politics and philosophy like you're drawing a geometric theorem on a chalkboard and start thinking about how you're going to live your own life, first and foremost, right? To some of you, that may sound as trite as a Hallmark card. You don't, you don't get the point I'm trying to make here, okay? Some of you will not really say, do we start with a chalkboard and an abstract theorem in trying to define homosexuality and trying to come to a clear, concise conclusion? What is the true meaning of being a homosexual? And do we then choose to live our lives trying to satisfy that ideal, trying to live up to it? No, no. Most people progress through stages of uncertainty and conflicted feelings. They may have a period of time where they feel like they're bisexual and then decide that they're gay or they don't feel that they know or they, they think they're completely straight, but then they happen to have one romantic relationship where they fall in love with someone of the same gender and they question their sexuality, right? There's a whole role of desire and ignorance and uncertainty and doubt and self-doubt. and That's how people live through their sexuality, right? And then... At some point in that process, at the end of that process, the middle of the process, they can stop and look at the chalkboard and say, oh, hey, what is the definition of homosexuality? And what are my feelings and what are my experiences and then where do I fit? But it's really an afterthought, right? Why does it even matter? So we dealt with it something like this, this example of a guy, he thinks of himself as heterosexual, he's married to a woman, but he does actually have sexual affairs with men. He only has oral sex with men, he doesn't have anal sex. Should he think of himself as straight or gay or bisexual? This may sound like a, a joke to you. Think about what I'm challenging the guy on the other side to do. Think about what I'm, I'm trying to get him to do. I'm trying to get him to realize that he is again and again proceeding from abstract theorems on a chalkboard. He's living his life as if the definition of socialism is something written on a chalkboard, the definition of anarchism, the definition of communism. And then he turns around and looks at the real world. And he's demanding that the real world satisfy this definition. He's demanding of himself. He sees his role in life as living up to these definitions. He's beholden to 
the definitions. The abstract reasoning on the chalkboard is primary for him. And for me, it's not even secondary. It's less than secondary. It's nothing. All right. This is a really pragmatic element of nihilism. What, what is the meaning of homosexuality? What's the point of taking a word like this and describing yourself? With, what's the point of someone stepping forward at their office and telling their coworker that they're gay? All right. It has nothing to do with any definition on any chalkboard or in any dictionary. You got a guy, he wears a nice suit to work every day, he has a female coworker. At first, they just go out to lunch with a group of coworkers, and then the two of them get along and they start going out to lunch, just the two of them. And at some point, he tells her that he's gay. All right. Now, being gay means different things to different people. Maybe this guy, maybe his actual experience is that he's had sex with more women than he has men. It could mean all kinds of things, right? Uh, you know, his actual lived experience of homosexuality, you could get into all the nitty gritty of it and what he's dealing with now and what, what his life was like when he was a teenager. And the woman might even be shocked because maybe she's seen on Facebook or on Instagram that in the past he had a girlfriend or something. You know, you, there, there are all kinds of, this is human complexity. What, what's the point of one human being letting another know that they're, that they're gay? Obviously, it's going to shape the future of that relationship. She's going to say, oh, okay. She's going to think about him and her relationship with him in a different way. The point is not for the word to give flesh and blood reality to the abstraction written on the chalkboard. The word functions only for me to express something to you about myself. If you call yourself a communist, if you call yourself a socialist, you're telling me nothing about communism. You're telling me nothing about the facts of economics or the facts of history. You're telling me something about you. You're telling me something about who you are, what kind of person you are, above all else, ethically. You're telling me also about what kind of person you want to be, what you're going to do in the future, what kind of difference in the world you're trying to make. It is just self-expression. It's self-expression. There's, there's no question of trying to satisfy a perfect definition of communism or a perfect definition of socialism. And it is not just the case that it's pointless for someone like him, this younger man I was talking about, it's not just the case that it's pointless for him to engage in this tit-for-tat game of saying, well, how precisely do you define communism? And for him to then claim that the ideals of communism or the economic system of communism are not besmirched by the real world experience of what happened in the Soviet Union or communist China under the dictatorship of Mao Zedong, right? That is not harmless. Right? That is not harmless. Anyone who meets him and listens to him saying that, who sees him playing those games on the chalkboard, right? They're going to react to that the same way I react. When I meet someone on the internet who starts putting forward claims about the relationship between race and IQ, when I meet someone on the internet who starts putting forward the theory that an extraordinary number of Jewish people have won the Nobel Prize uh, for the following reasons. When I meet someone on the internet putting forward the theory that the Buddha had blonde hair and blue eyes, all the time people raise questions and make factual assertions and open up lines of political and philosophical argument. And they are not explicitly telling you that they're a neo-Nazi. They're not explicitly telling you that they're alt-right and spend all their time reading crazy alt-right conspiracy theories. They may even just make statements about the history of the Roman Empire or the history of ancient Egypt. You know, like seriously. But if you know your stuff, if you know this material, right away you can tell, whoa, this person is making an excuse for something that only neo-Nazis and alt-right people make excuses for. This person is engaging in something that reflects what they've been reading, where they come from, in terms of their intellectual background, right? And that's who this person really is, all right? So this young man, when he is playing games in this way with offering justifications for communism, when he's saying positive things about the ideals of Lenin, even though he combines that with critical statements about Lenin and critical statements about Mao Zedong, okay? The actual net effect of what he's saying, it just makes me think he is a crypto-communist. 
And many people who watch my interaction with him and watch the comments popping up, they said, whoa, this guy's whole audience seems to be comprised of crypto communists. And that's how the internet works. You know, like attracts like the type of people who would enjoy hearing those kinds of mealy-mouthed, middle-of-the-road statements, rationalizing what Mao Zedong did and trying to rescue the pure definition of communism from the chalkboard. My fundamental point here is that thinking in the first person, thinking about yourself and your desires first and foremost, all right, and thinking about the abstract meanings of words on a chalkboard, not even secondarily, but really, really it doesn't enter into our philosophizing and our political theorizing at all, all right? Thinking about yourself as a creative person, as a destructive person, as someone who's going to change history from your tiny pinpoint on the map and the tiny chronological span of your life. And nobody knows how long it is, right? Yes, in theory, you could get hit by a car tomorrow, very unlikely, but you know, it's not reasonable to rationalize how you're living your life here and now in terms of grandiose abstractions, whether you think of these as platonic abstractions or Marxist abstractions, frankly, that exist in all times for all people. Right? It doesn't make sense to rationalize what you're doing here and now with reference to some utopia that's supposedly going to exist on Earth more than a thousand years into the future. Let's, let's put a human face on that. I've considered, I've considered applying for and getting Israeli citizenship. To live in Israel would be very difficult for me politically. I think in Israel, ironically, I would probably only hang out with far left-wing people. Those would be the only people willing to talk to me. I'd probably hang out with left-wing vegans. You'd be living in a war zone. And it's a war where I really don't have a lot of sympathy for either side engaged in the war. I'm, you know, you guys have some sense of going, I'm an atheist. I'm a very active, vocal atheist. So it's very difficult for me to say anything good about any government that is openly theocratic. All right. I'm not real sympathetic for the government of Saudi Arabia. The modern state of Israel, it's better than Saudi Arabia, but it's a much worse government than the government of Switzerland. Admittedly, the Swiss Constitution opens by invoking the name of God. Switzerland is not a perfectly atheist. Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I wish Switzerland were 100% atheist, but it's not. All right, with that digression, with that digression aside. Um, <laughs> a well-deserved pause. Hold on. Would it make sense for me to live my life in Israel now with reference to some future utopia in which all the Jews have ceased believing in Judaism, all the Muslims have ceased to believe in Islam, and everyone embraces each other in, in brotherhood. Even if you believe that's the inevitable future, if you believe that's coming 500 years from now, 300 years would be too... Too close, right? Is it 500 years? Is it 1,000 years? Even if you believe in that, not as something probable, but as something definite and certain and inevitable, right? It would be a gross, bizarre aberration in your life to live your own life, to make your decisions here and now with reference to that future utopia, that future outcome, which is, of course, incredibly improbable. You've got to make your decisions here and now based on who you are, reality in the world, around you and what you can accomplish in the next five years, right? What sense does it make for someone to live their life and make their decisions here and now with reference to a future communist utopia, a future socialist utopia, or in this kid's case, a future anarchist utopia, and to treat that, to treat that as a certainty, not as a fantasy, but as something they believe in as inevitable, as certain, and then to make your decisions about the real world and what you can accomplish here and now with, with references to, to live your whole life in the shadow of this unreal ideal. You guys have heard me say before, you know, 
atheism is not enough. It's not enough to just reject the belief in a particular god or a particular religious system. You have to challenge the religiosity of our ways of thinking about everything, right? You have to challenge these fixed ideals that haunt us, that shape our lives when we're dreaming as well as when we're awake, right? What you have to do is learn to live with the dynamism of doubt, all right? Do you think that one day in the future, all Muslims will just stop believing in Islam and will embrace Jewish people as their equals, will happily let their sons and daughters intermarry with Jewish people, will see no invidious distinction between Muslims, between Muslims and Jews? Do you, do you see that? Do you see that as the inevitable future? Do you think that's definite? you think that's certain? Wouldn't it be different to live your life acknowledging that that's a beautiful fantasy but that there's every reason to doubt that? Wouldn't it be better to live with constant gnawing doubt about just how bad the conflict is and that it could get worse and that it could get worse and worse and worse and that the future could actually be worse than the past? That the future for the Jewish people could be worse than what happened in World War II? Isn't that something to fear? Isn't that something to doubt? Right? All this horseshit that comes out of Marxism, all these certainties, all these fables about the future, right? The, the problem is the impact they have on the present here and now, right? There's this old catchphrase in the academic study of, uh, of history. I'm sorry, I forget who said it first. It's probably John Dewey or someone really boring like that. You know, we study history uh, not to take something away from the past, but for what it adds to the present, right? The problem is that people live with these fantasies about the future, with these convictions about what's inevitable and certain about the future, and it really takes something away from the present, all right? Um, the leitmotif of that discussion was my saying to this kid, look, the process we're engaged in here is not about setting up a perfect definition of socialism on the chalkboard, a perfect geometric theorem. It's not about defining these concepts precisely so that you can believe in them, all right? The point is to critique and debunk and discard all ideologies, all ideals, so that you can start believing in yourself. The most fundamental insight of my teenage years was the realization that all authority is mere authorship. Karl Marx was at one time a struggling author just trying to write a hit book. Okay, some of you in the audience will know what that's like. I'm right now trying to write a book. I hope, I hope as many as 1,000 people, 500 people I'd be happy with. I'm trying to write a hit book on a tiny scale. I'm trying to write a book that's appealing to and meaningful for a tiny, tiny niche market. And I pointed this out in an earlier uh, video. He had very specific examples of authors who'd been successful in the, in the decades uh, leading up to this. And he modeled what he was trying to do as a creative writer, as an author. And he came up with these stories, with these fables, and millions of people died because these stories set the human imagination on fire, okay? But they're just stories. He's just an author. He's just a storyteller. And so are you. So are you and you and you, okay? There's a very real sense in which the whole world's history begins and ends with your life, right? your potential to make a difference in the world, what you can accomplish in the next five years. That has to be your concern, not any geometric theorem, not any definition of any set of concepts written up on a chalk.